Now, okay, one, two, three. Yes, so this is, uh, this is the first exceptional uh, higher graph. So this is like a Dunkin diagram. It behaves in a way very much like the E6 Dunkin diagram, in my view. And, uh, and uh, here, by a completely new method, it's uh, here there were some numbers all over 24, some spectrum of unitaries, and this is a spectrum that we're going to find. If you arrange those numbers in a rectangle, but then you make the rectangle oblique, that's what you get. So anyway, this is the, uh, this is the, the first exceptional uh, Dunkin uh, uh, diagram, higher Dunkin diagram, and uh, the, uh, I mean, I had f computed the first few, but uh, the whole series was constructed, uh, uh, infinite series over all the SLNs, so uh, at all the altitudes was constructed by Zhang Gui for this. So we shall, uh, this was just a screen test. We're going to cut it and go uh, in a very pedestrian way to prove the following. So let G be an AD graph. The others are treated very easily the same way. Uh, this is a theorem. Uh, consider the ribbon. This is an AD graph uh, with Coxeter. number equal to n, which means that uh, the norm as a matrix of the adjacency matrix, or Laplacian of the graph G, is quantum to at the nth root of unity, which is uh, 2 cosine of pi over n. And uh, we define the ribbon as uh, the integers modulo 2n, Cartesian product over z mod 2 with uh, g. Since we take it over Z mod 2, it has how many points? It's uh, uh, this would be 2n, but since we take it over Z mod 2, it's uh, n times the dimension of G vertices. And uh, we take the uh, the vertices of the ribbon as orthonormal vectors. Remember, I was telling you that inspired by physics. Uh, Whenever you have uh, two things, you can create a vector space as linear combinations of the two, right? And these two objects will be the orthonormal basis. That's the best way to think concretely about uh, something like a, a Hilbert space here. And uh, then we take, so as vectors, uh, these points, these vertices of the ribbon are 
of the form uh, I alpha, where alpha is in the vertices of G. Yes, and I is in uh, Z mod 2N. And now we take uh, the function, the Dirac mass. Now we look at uh, functions which are biharmonic. So we have a subspace, so we have the functions vert to C. This will denote by the vertices, the functions vertices to C. And uh, in these, among these, we take the functions. Oh, here, actually, uh, well, we can take it into anything, but R, I think, is better. Somehow, and then we take uh, um, the, the functions with the property, so subspace, so this is, this is R to the vert, which are functions vertices to R. And we have a linear subspace uh, of uh, biharmonic Is this part visible? I don't want to, or not so visible. Is it? Okay. Um, the biharmonic uh, functions. The ones for which delta G or minus delta on Z mod 2N apply to F is zero. Remember that, um, well, we'll explain this in a moment. So what we want to show today is that uh, the subspace, so let's call this the subspace, <coughs> subspace by harmonic. <coughs> so uh, what we want to show now is that uh, one, the subspace by harmonic is spanned by <coughs> by the um, fusion numbers, which are the same as <coughs> numbers of essential paths from vertices I alpha, we'll detail it a little bit further. Then number two, that uh, the projection onto biharmonic of the Kronecker symbol of the unit mass or if you are the orthonormal vector I alpha, is equal to some constant, which is something like N, I think here, uh, uh, N inverse times the, uh, So let's put this fusion
times fusion of I alpha minus fusion of uh, I minus 2 and alpha. And we shall write here as a comment. that uh, scaled, properly scaled, the numbers re vertices from the vertices into the natural into Z, into the integers. for a point I alpha are the inner product of the root I alpha with each of the other roots. Thus, the vertices of the ribbon the roots of type G. And uh, the numbers here are described the inner products. The space by harmonic space of functions which have the same sum vertically and horizontally is the linear span of roots which we're going to call here the root space and the scale projections on the on this space are the geometrical roots which means with angles with the correct angles
for any vector in the root space the values of the biharmonic function, the corresponding biharmonic function. Remember that we define these vectors exactly as biharmonic functions, yes, are the inner product for any vector v, the inner product of v with each root. So this is an overdetermined system of coordinates. characterized by by harmonicity weights of type AD of type G are characterized, are defined not by us, but in general Lee theory I'll motivated right away, defined by the fact, uh, actually not weights, but yes, weights are defined exactly by the property that the inner product with roots is, is integer. So this is the uh, you should call it quantization. I should make here a comment. So remember weights were the eigenvalues of eigenvectors in a representation. Yes, so vectors which encoded the eigenvalue. So roots were the eigenvalues in the adjoint representation. So roots were characterizing, for instance, for matrices, the elements Eij. Yes, weights are the things on which the EIJs act. Yes, so the reason you want to have them quantized exactly like this is that uh, um, the representations that we defined are uh, differential. So 
the, they apply to the Lie algebra, to things in the neighborhood of the identity. If you want a differential, and just think of the diagonal of the, of, uh, say, matrices, yes? Diagonal of the matrices, if you take the diagonal of uh, unitary matrices, the torus, uh, circles, if you want these circles to close, when you integrate the differential, you need an integrality condition. Yes? If you, want, if you have a, a differential representation of the circle, there's just uh, some number to the power alpha, yes? Uh, think of the circle as uh, sitting in the complex plane. Z, z to the alpha for any alpha, basically. Uh, if you want this to close, that alpha needs to be uh, some uh, uh, integer, yes? So that's, uh, that's a reason. So anyway, uh, now can you see here from what we just said, since the inner product with every root should be an integer, yes? And since those inner products are exactly the values on vertices, what it means is that the weights are precisely the functions what? in a product with roots. These are exactly the coordinates on the ribbon, yes? So it means that the weights are uh, precisely the functions on the ribbon, which are biharmonic. Let's write it. Thus, weights. are functions, are the functions from the vertices of the ribbon to Z. So are the biharmonic functions from the ribbon to Z. And an example of that is exactly the fusion, what we had before, the number of essential paths. We'll see that those are exactly highest weights and so on. So uh, weights are functions from the vertices of the ribbon to Z. Let's put one more thing about the ribbon, wow. So uh, uh, one more thing about the ribbon is that uh, the, the shift I alpha goes into I plus two alpha down the ribbon. Is uh, distinguished is a coxet element, let's write it here. And we'll define this. Distinguished by the ribbon. Conversely, A choice of a coxet element organizes the roots. into a ribbon. Yes, so if you choose a coxet element that puts a, 
And maybe last but not least, yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, they have to be scaled to become integers. I think they're scaled by the for this for the by the Coxeter number. So you get one over the Coxeter number times uh, the projection. The projection of one will have norm smaller than one. Yes. Yeah. After you scale it, it will become integers. Yes. So, uh, so in particular, if you have uh, the vertices of the ribbon to Z, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll discuss this, yes, o on very simple examples and so. But last but not least, maybe the most important, I think, uh, uh, my host here, Arthur, is always pushing me, forget about the classical stuff, let's go to the new stuff. Yes, uh, and I must say that actually uh, I had a, uh, a student who uh, studied with me, uh, I think about six or seven years, and we never arrived at the things backwards, at, the th at any of the things I discussed here. So there's a lot uh, to come. But uh, here, the remark which... Uh, kind of redeems the whole thing, is that all of the above holds suitably adapted to the higher roots and weights. Including the proof that I'm going to give. So, uh, and I'll describe these higher things right away. You have seen that star, right? That was an exceptional graph, yeah? So uh, here, the Z mod 2n, if you know a little bit of uh, Lie algebra, the so Z mod 2n stands for weights of uh, SL2. They're the weights of SL2, they are the spin, not spin numbers, yes? half integers doubled. And uh, so they lie on a line. If you work over SL3, then the roots, then the weight lattice, uh, which may be a chase. Could I ask you, there's a graph like this, but yellow in, the, in our office. So uh, Chase will bring the, the weight lattice. I don't have it here. This is a, a root lattice of uh, SL4. So these are roots. Uh, here are some. And uh, uh, instead of the line, instead of Z mod N, we'll have, in the higher case, a piece of the weight lattice of the corresponding uh, of the corresponding group, which I'm going to define. So the idea here, I mean, this is not, it cannot be a, a substitute for uh, learning about the Lie groups because there would be simply no time for that. However, um, it, uh, um, we shall do in great detail the case of uh, of Z mod, I mean the case of uh, matrices, uh, which is uh, which is quite uh, quite interesting, and uh, we'll do the roots and uh, weights there. Uh, let me see if you have any are there any questions. No. 
I think I had a real ribbon. This was a pocket model, and the ribbon here is this thing at the very top. So again, we'll, we'll use this model. So let's, uh, let's go a little bit and uh, uh, see a couple of examples. So if we, uh, uh, what, what is meant by this long uh, theorem? So we, we take uh, first, let's take the graph A2, which is the graph of SL3. Yes, and uh, so these are three by three matrices. with trace zero. Oh, thank you. Yes, these are the weights of, uh, thank you very much, Chris. So these are the weights of SL4, and uh, this, this replaces a Z mod uh, 2N in the higher case. Uh, this green one, yes. Ah, very, uh, ex very good question. These are roots, yes. These are roots of SL4, the lattice of roots of SL4. Remember, the roots are the weights of the self joint, uh, I mean, of the, uh, of the R joint representation, yes, of SL4 acting on itself, yes. And uh, they have some parity. So here, uh, actually my models were destroyed on the way to Harvard because they have been packed. Uh, they were fairly delicate. I, I, and uh, they were packed with some heavy object. It was very much like uh, sending your uh, china together with a bowling ball in, in a one cubic meter box. So I remade this. And you see, I colored the vertices with four colors. As you can see, white, yellow, blue, and orange. Yes? These are the parities. So these are weights of SL4. They have a parity. And if you look at the white ones, parity zero, yes? You see here you have white, white, white here. Yes, they are exactly the, the lattice, this lattice. Yes, so this is a sub lattice, but they're scaled. You see, so once again, this, this here is a root of SL4, and it's exactly one of these. Does that answer your questions? You can see how they, uh, you can see here, you can interpret this, the small yellow and white and all that inside as weights, yes? So you can see these are roots of SL4. Yeah, the roots are the off-diagonal elements, HIJ, right? So how many would you have for HIJ? Uh, off-diagonal things, yes? So you have all the pairs IJ, I different from J between one and four, right? of diagonal elements EIJ, remember those are the eigenvectors, yes? So you'd have uh, four times four, which is 16, minus a diagonal, you'd have 12, yes? And these are the 12, the outside of this are the 12 roots of, uh, of SL4, geometrically, yes? So the condition there, they have inner products, integer inner products with each other. If you look from the center, each of the green edges here, yes, occupies exactly 60 degrees, pi over three. Yes, so the inner product of two uh, vertices connected by an edge is one. Yes, if there are two edges apart, it's two, like this. Uh, so, excuse me, the inner product is negative one, yes? Then, the, then you have two pi over three, right? 120 degrees. Look, if you look this way, you can see 120 degrees between my fingers from the center, yes? Right? So you see 60 degrees inner product one, 120 degrees 
in a product negative one. Opposite in a product uh, negative two, yes? And uh, things which are not connected at all, not on the same uh, diameter like these two here, opposite in a square, they, these, are, these, have, uh, these are perpendicular to each other. They have, they have uh, inner product zero. Yes, so the inner products are plus two with itself, negative two with its opposite, and the others are plus and minus one. Yes, and uh, so um, so let's take this A2. Well, why not start with A1, A1, wow, A1. Let's start with A1. A1 is a dot, and this should correspond to SL2. And uh, the ribbon in this case is a dot and another dot. Remember, it's a dot times, uh, so this is on the level 0, 1, 2, 3. So the Coxeter number here, n, is 2. Yes, and we have the levels 1, 2, 3, 4, which is the same as 0. Yes, so this is z mod 2 times 2. Yes, so we have two points here. And uh, uh, what are these roots? You see in, uh, in the two by two matrices, you have E1, 2 and E2, 1, yes, of diagonal. So these give you H1, 2, which is plus one, plus one, negative one and H21, which is negative one plus one. Yes? And uh, huh. what can you see here about, uh, so these are the, the, so this is H12 and H21. What should be the, uh, the fusion? The fusion is here one. Well, the fusion is just fusion with one, because uh, this is SL2 at a root of unity where it has only one representation, the trivial. Yes, so the number of paths is one here, plus one, but we shall see that we continue it with, <coughs> we continue it with uh, the negative. So this is a biharmonic function. The sum here is zero. And uh, uh, what do you see? If you take the function one and you project it onto the biharmonic function, the biharmonic functions are spanned by these. One will go into what? Can you see if you project one as one zero? Yes. You project it on the linear space of functions with difference, I mean, which are of the form x negative x, is going to give you what? Oh, the linear algebra, remember there was one little requirement for the course, a little bit of linear algebra. So if you project it on the space of coordinates, which are this spanned by these, yes, it's going to give you, I think, one. I'm, I, I mean, it's a bit intuitive. It's one negative one over two, right? Yes? We have here a group who works, which works in quantum information, who work all the time with this kind of thing. So this one, if we, uh, if we scale it, uh, so how can we check that this is, this is a projection? Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but a one zero, we take the inner product. You see, if you have a projection, if you have a vector here, V, and if you, if you have a projection, so this is a projection of V. Yes? Uh, the way you check that something is a projection of V is what? 
you see a, a bit intuitive with some inner products. Oh, come on, guys, no. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Take the inner product, uh, not with V, so you, you have this candidate for the projection, yes? Remember that theorem by the, done by the Greeks, actually, seen by the Greeks uh, 2,000 years ago, yes? I think that uh, somehow uh, the problem is with our linear algebra courses. You see, linear algebra should be taught as operators, things that move things and so on. And uh, our teaching of linear algebra stopped somehow at the level of, uh, of finding the kernel of something, just solving a linear system, yes? And uh, which is useful, I mean, it may be the most useful part maybe of linear algebra, but it's not uh, everything. What you do is you take some vector W here in this plane, yes? And you check that V dot W is equal to, let's see, the inner product, yes, is equal to the projection of V with W. This was a theorem which was seen by the Greeks 2,000 years ago, though in a different language, yes? And this characterizes a projection. Yeah, is this part clear? Because V decomposes, you see, into, into a, a, a normal vector and the projection. So, so here the normal vector times W is going to be zero, yes? And conversely, if this holds, this shows exactly the normal, that you have subtracted the normal, the normal thing, yes? Another way is to project it on the normal and subtract that, yes? Very good, that's what we're going to do. So, uh, let's check now with our one, negative one, this, uh, uh, let's check what would this be times another vector of this form, which is one, negative one. Yes, this is two, yes? While our original vector, one, zero, times one, negative one, this was one, yes? So the projection must be one negative one over two, yes? So uh, one half of this is one, yes? And is equal to this, right? That's exactly the idea of the check. So here, uh, you, as you see, we have divided by uh, the Coxeter number, yes? So we need to scale it by the Coxeter number. So uh, A2, SL3. Uh, SL3, the, uh, this is just uh, A2 looks like this, yes? And the ribbon will look like that. Now, how far should we go? Since the coxeter here, the coxeter is n is equal to three. For this, the coxeter is uh, is uh, the length of the graph plus one. Yes. Remember, coxeter of a n is n plus one. Uh, coxeter of d n is equal to two n minus two. Yes, and coxeta of uh, E678 is 12, 18, and 30, respectively. Yeah? I don't understand how you decide to generate ribbons from A1 and A2, for instance. Uh, yeah. Let me, very good question. So let me show you. Uh, on A1, it's a little bit trickier because it's degenerate, so A2 should be good. Yes, so uh, let's, let's do this zigzag here. Uh, please ask, you see, the, the thing about this course is that I have worked on these things for a very long time in my garden, yes? sitting in a long chair and all that. So I had no reaction whatsoever. So uh, the problem with that is that I may not be quite aware of what is obvious and what is not. 
So I absolutely rely on, uh, on your reaction. Uh, and this six should be zero, yes? So here's what we do. We take the graph, do you see the graph A2? Let's do it here thinly, yes? So this is a graph A2 times Z mod two times three times Z mod six. Yes, so this is linked to the top. This is a ribbon. I have ordered from a, uh, from a magician's supply store Amazingly, they had a ribbon, which is more or less exactly what we need. <laughs> so you can see that ribbons exist in nature. Uh, now, uh, you see here the graph, so we take the graph G, which is A2, and we take the Cartesian product with uh, Z mod 6, right? Is this part clear? It's this rectangle, right? One, two, three, and so on. And we take a, a, every other vertex. Now, this is not a fundamental uh, requirement, and you see it's not there in general, but if we take paths, do you see these paths move one notch on the graph, and they move one notch downwards, yes? So it means that they, they preserve this uh, parity. They have the same parity downwards as sideways, yes? So the point is that you could not have a path from here here. You see, because you'd have to sit on the graph while actually you, you move on the graph, yes? So in the higher case, you do have some graphs which do not have the parity, module three or something, and there the ribbon does not, uh, does not uh, I mean, it uses uh, more points. Does this answer your question? So this is, this is the, uh, and what should these be? Uh, what should these, these points be, yes? Let's uh, see them. So first of all, the biharmonic functions, how do they look like? Well, let's take the fusion from here. The fusion from here would be one, you see, from this point, from zero, let's call this one and two. Uh, now maybe I'll call them zero and one. These are really representations of SL2. Yes, and that's a spin zero, and the other one is a spin one half of SL2. So we are at the root of unity where the spin one is cut off. Yes, the spin one would have what dimension? Three. So we are at the third root of unity where the quantum number three is zero, yes? That's why you see here, this tells you at what root of unity we are, right? So at n is equal to three, the third, the spin uh, one and a half, uh, the spin one, yes, is killed, yes? These are double the spins, the degree. So there we are, and the first function, fusion function is one, one, yes? You see, this is, so you basically, this is a multiplication table. This is a multiplication table dot, I mean sigma, one, that's a generator, tensor, dot. This is a spin one half, since we are in a physics building. Yes, yeah, a spin one half, tensor, dot, yes? So uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, wait. No, I shouldn't say this. This is sigma zero tensor, dot. This is a spin zero. So this, the numbers are two times the spin. Sigma zero, this is sigma one tensor dot, and this is sigma two tensor dot. And you remember that sigma two was killed, yes? So this should give us zero. And now we have sigma 
three tensor dot. And what should that be? We are at the uh, at a root of unity. This is uh, the sine function. Uh, n is three, so we divide this in three. Yes, and this is here quantum one. So this this curve is sine, and uh, this is uh, quantum zero, which is zero. This is quantum one, which is one. Now quantum two is also one, yes. And of course these are the third root of unity, yes. So this is quantum number at the third unity, root of unity. Quantum three, which was killed. Quantum four which is what? Minus one, quantum five is minus one, yes? And quantum six is zero, and this is a period. Yes? And notice here that the natural thing, so we should interpret the zero here as a mirror. And with this, the, the representation, so this was a representation sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two was killed, sigma three, sigma four, sigma five, yes, which was killed. So, um, so this is a mirror, so we should take sigma three to be what? What's your suggestion here? No, uh, it should be what representation? So sigma three should be one of the others, but with a sign, yes. Sigma three should be the negative of sigma one, do you see? And this means just a, a negative copy which cancels a positive one. When we count things. Yes, so it doesn't mean uh, anything about the structure of the of sigma itself. Yes, it's just a negative copy of uh, of sigma three, which cancels the positive one of sigma three. Why is, so for each of the points on the graph, so for the one corresponding to zero, it's sigma zero tensor dot, right? Yeah. But why is sigma zero associated with quantum one on, on this? Graph? That's a dimension. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you. See, I have forgotten to write. So this is a dimension, and remember, so the usual formula is a dimension of sigma, and this is uh, uh, n, is quantum n plus one. Yes, for these, and this n is twice the spin. Yes, so uh, if you had spin j, the dimension is 2j plus one. As you remember, that counts the basis, yes? So you have polynomials. This n plus one comes from polynomials, homogeneous polynomials of degree n, yes? These will go from e1 to the n, e2 to the zero, all the way up to e1 to the zero, e2 to the power n, yes? And there are n plus one of them, which is where that n plus one is coming from. Uh, 
And uh, here, now you must go very far back in time. Remember, we should stop here, but before that, yes, you should make a big trip in time, not at the first grade where you learned addition, but to your second grade where you learned multiplication, exactly. So this thing is simply a multiplication table. You see, this is a multiplication. This was sigma zero and sigma one. You see sigma zero tends to sigma zero is sigma zero, yes? Sigma zero tends to sigma one is? Sigma one. Sigma uh, two tends to sigma zero. So sigma zero tends to sigma two is? That's a tricky zero because sigma two is killed, yes? So remember that this sigma two is equal to zero, yes? And then sigma three, do you see it gives you here negative one, and here it gives you a negative one, yes? And then zero again, and then you're back at one, yes? Right? So you see this is a mirror. And this is a reflection up, down, yes? In the mirror, and here another reflection, yes? And what I am saying, you should check that the projection, uh, the projection of, uh, uh, of uh, the one, zero, zero, and everything zero, yes? Onto uh, the biharmonic is equal to what do you think? The inner product of that root with the others, which is what? With itself, the inner product is two. Remember, these are plus one negative ones, yes? Right? So this is two, then one, then z uh, two, one, and then it's zero, I think, and then it's negative one, negative no, there's no zero for this. It's two, one, negative one. Uh, let's see, two, and the opposite should be negative two. Yes, it's two, one, zero, negative one, negative two, negative one, and then it's again, uh, this is, why don't we leave this to you as an exercise? <laughs> Wonderful, so just find the projection of this, yes, on the functions generated by one, one, and zero, and negative one, negative one, yes? That's a very good exercise. And that would give you the product. I think it's, it's two, one, negative one, negative two, negative one, one, and then we're back to two, yes? That's the one that you should get. Divided by three, yes? By the Coxeter number, yes? So that way you get, so these are exactly your, your roots. You know, the roots are one, negative one, zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, one, negative one. Um, what are they? Negative one, one, zero, and uh, negative one, zero, one, yes? And finally, the sixth one is, is zero, negative one, one. And then the one moves again in front, yes? So these are the six roots. And the beautiful thing is that uh, all the, does this remind you of something? It has six terms. Guys, before you go, one, one fundamental question. Six terms, does it remind you of something that you've seen in uh, topology or something in all of mathematics? It's a six term exact sequence, yes? So all the six term exact sequences are modeled exactly on this ribbon. All the star operations are modeled exactly on this ribbon. All the products are modeled on the ribbon of A3 and all the associativity is modeled on the ribbon of, uh, of, a, uh, of, I mean, A4. 
Yes, so uh, we stop here.